Hello students, let us start the lesson Introduction to History. Whenever somebody is talking about past events, we can say that they are talking about history. However, it's not always the case that whenever we are talking about the past, it has to be historic. For example, anything that has validated proof or evidence can be called as history. Because you will be starting history lessons from now on, you need to understand what exactly classifies as history and what can be just considered as stories. So what is history? The systematic presentation of past events is called history. So whenever we are talking about the past, systematically we can regard that as history. It introduces the journey of human beings. So why is history important? It introduces the journey of human beings. It tells the failures and successes of humans in that journey. Whenever we are learning history, we need to just keep in mind what we can understand and take away from it. So it introduces to us the successes and failures of us in our past. Successful events and failures. So because it introduces us to the successes and failures of the past, we can learn from those events okay while explaining the historical e incidents the accuracy of time place and person are maintained whenever we are trying to document events the accuracy of time place and person are very important we'll soon learn the difference between history and story this means when the incident took place, where and by whom. So these things would be clear. So we need to always know three things. One is when. Next, we need to know where. And finally, we need to know by whom. Only when we know all these things accurately, we can regard it as history. Otherwise, it just becomes a story. Without these clarities, history becomes a story. So here we have a nice observation which gives us the differences between history and story. Once upon a time, there was a king in a place. He fought a war. So these are the kinds of stories that we have grown up listening to. The difference between them and history is, observe the next sentence, Ashoka, who ruled Pataliputra in 261 BCE fought the Kalinga war. So observe that the second sentence has so many more details than the first one. We know which ruler we are talking about. We know where the ruler had his kingdom. We also know the timing. And we also know the details of the war. That is, we know that it was the Kalinga war. So this becomes history whereas the first one can be regarded as a story. Why do we want history? This is another question that you might be thinking about. So why do we want history? Students, what happens if you touch the flame of fire? So what happens when you touch something really hot? It burns, doesn't it? This is experience. Will you touch the fire again? No, because you have already experienced the burning sensation, haven't you? We call this as memory, recollection and retention. So observe this very important distinction. Whenever you are experiencing something for the very first time, you are bound to make mistakes. But after you have made that mistakes, you keep that in your memory. You just think like, okay, if I touch something really hot, it's going to burn me. And then you're not going to repeat that the next time you see something hot. 
This is called as memory, recollection and retention. What would have happened if humans did not have memory at all? So what would have happened if we as human beings did not have memory at all? They would have committed the same mistakes again and again. So we would have committed the same mistakes again and again if we did not have experience. In this case, the progress of human beings is not possible. So if we are not able to learn from our past mistake and from our experiences, progress of us as a species would not have been possible. As human beings need memory to progress, so a society or a nation needs memory to progress. Similar to how us as individuals learn from our past experiences, the collective society or a country also needs something similar. It is inevitable. Then, what can be assumed as a memory for a society or a nation? That is history. So from history, we learn from experiences. History acts as memory to a collective of population or a collective of people such as a community or, or a country. So a nation or a society. Okay. So those things classify as history and why do we need history? It's because it acts as a memory to a collective of people. Yes, like memory serves humans to survive, history serves as memory for a society, state, nation and the whole world. History is a record of good and wrong decisions. So it's not useful to us if we just keep in mind only the good decisions or only the incorrect or wrong ones. It only serves the purpose if we keep track of everything that happens in a systematic manner. So history is a record for good and wrong decisions, joyful and sorrowful experiences and the difficulties faced by our ancestors. Besides, it wants the future decision-making process. There is a saying called history repeats itself. So this is a fairly popular way of saying that we need to learn from our history. History repeats. This means that if you go on making the same mistakes or the same bad decisions that we did in our past, the same things are going to happen because the consequences of those decisions would not have changed. Because history repeats, we need to learn from the same. The principles, values and ideologies of our ancestors in their history will become a model and guiding force for their descendants. So history is a way how information can be passed on, information and knowledge, even wisdom can be passed on from one generation to the descending generations. Whenever you learn something valuable, it is in our nature to document it so that others can learn from the same. So these principles, values and ideologies will act as a guiding force for the coming generations. Not only that, we can also be inspired from the past events. So here, their valor, adventures, patriotism and sacrifices will inspire the next generations. Moreover, by introducing our culture and his heritage, history arouses the feeling of pride and honor for our nation and the world at large. Whenever we see something that has a lot of value and heritage, it gives us a sense of pride about our people. 
whenever we visit an historic monument we feel happy to know that we are descended from such a culture which is why study of history is important so here we learn about who started documenting history herodotus of greece was the first to show the world how to construct this immensely valuable history hence he is considered the father of history so we know that here we can see a picture of the father of history now let us try to know what all should be included for something to document to be documented as valuable history we learned that there are differences between historical sources and just plain stories now let us learn what needs to be included in a well documented history firstly we have sources let us learn about sources the one who construct history is a historian so anybody who constructs history he or she is called as a historian they use historical evidences to be particular and authentic about history so it is believed that there cannot be history without sources then what are the sources of history the sources of history can be classified into two groups before we go into the two groups imagine the situation suppose you are telling your friends about a very interesting fact you read you will definitely get the question where did you read it from did you read it from a book did you get it from the internet or did you perhaps hear it from one of your other friends so this is called as sources whenever there's a piece of knowledge there's always a source knowledge has sources so whenever there is any knowledge in question it should have come from somewhere so that is called as the source of knowledge in history we have two types of sources one is literary sources the other one is archaeological sources okay now let us learn about these two sources one by one sources means where does that knowledge come from so literary sources historically speaking literature means the written or orally conveyed information so historically speaking literature literature means something that is written or orally conveyed there are two kinds in this one is written the other is oral written literature can be further classified into native and foreign literature so we have native and we also have foreign literature oral literature comprises of folk songs stories ballets uh, myths and legends written literature is constructed by literates but oral literature is constructed by illiterates so this might not already always be the case oral literature that includes folk songs stories and such also is a valuable source of information this has been passed on from the past and when you dig deep into such sources you'll get to know about its origin and what it's talking about whereas literal literature i mean written literature it has some more authenticity to it because it has been documented on paper okay so written literature it can be further classified into native and foreign literature now as in when you are reading your textbook you should keep in mind about making notes from the same i am doing the same thing over here whenever there is something that you need to know you just make notes of it point wise this way you cultivate the habit of making notes which is very important in your higher education so what did we just learn we learned about literary sources for history so literary sources there are two types the first type is written and the second type is oral 
what else did we learn the written type it consists of two other types it can be native or foreign in language whereas oral literature it consists of uh, folk songs ballets and others okay so observe that you need not have to write down everything that you learn you just have to make note of it point wise so that it's easier for you when you refer to your notes let's get back to the lesson next we can talk about archaeological sources so archaeology is the study of physical remains or ruins so the physical remains or ruins of things used or constructed structures in the past are archaeological sources so the physical remains observe around you we as human beings have a lot of things around us for example if you are sitting on a table in your room studying there are a lot of physical things around you be it your table be it the bed be it a door be it any electronic equipment around you all these are physical things that we use what happens after our time these physical remains will continue to be in existence so the physical remains of the past can teach us about the past events and they are obtained through archaeological sources so the physical remains or ruins of the things used or the constructed structures in the past are archaeological sources the remains that have been buried in the earth are removed through excavation the historical evidences including coins inscriptions monuments and pieces of pots and other artifacts so all these things are valuable because they teach us about our past events so here is a picture of a pot or a utensil that has been excavated from a or archaeological site observe that as soon as something is unearthed there is detailed documentation of the thing that has been discovered let me show you a picture of an archaeologist so this is an archaeologist keep in mind that archaeology needs to be very delicate because we do not want to damage anything that we are finding so this is an image of an archaeologist that is uncovering some remains so we found out about the archaeological sources next the scientific process involved in digging the earth to obtain the ancient remains of fossils of our ancient people is called as excavation brush trowel knife wood needles are used to move the layers of the earth so this is not a very easy process because the remains would have been buried deep into the earth just because they are buried so deep you can't just drill it at one point because you don't know what is going to be under there and you don't want to damage anything so brute force is not the proper approach here instead they make use of specialized tools such as the brush trowel knife and wood needles to move the layers of earth the pieces of pot coins beads crystals and bones thus obtained are subjected to scientific research so further research and observation about whatever you have uncovered is going to give us the details about what we have found so here we have the sources of history so whenever you come across something like this this can be considered as a flow chart so this is also a very effective tool for you to make your notes so the first thing that you need to uh, do is make sure that you have a proper his uh, heading here we have the heading sources of history and then we got to know there are two sources similarly you can go on adding details and adding new levels okay so keep in mind you now need to be learning effective ways of making notes 
Now, we are starting India as introduced by Europeans. Indians had the knowledge of history in the form of Puranas and myths from ancient times. But this was different from the European model of constructing history. So we as Indians, we had the way of passing on information in the form of Puranas and myths. So Indians had the form of Puranas and myths. We used Puranas and myths to pass on information. This was the Indian model. Okay. However, this was different from the European model. Among the Europeans who arrived in India in 16th century were Jesuit priests. They undertook a systematic study to understand the lifestyle of Indians. The Europeans chose a systematic manner to study a civilization. So when they came to India in the 16th century, they undertook a systematic study of Indians. Hendrik Roth, who was settled in Agra, translated Sanskrit grammar into Latin language about 350 years ago. A century later, Father Kudo identified that there are many similarities between Sanskrit and European languages. So, these are going to give you one by one about the different initiatives taken by the Europeans who came into India in 16th century about their efforts in documenting the history of Indians. So we have the Jesu priests who undertook a systematic study to understand the lifestyle of Indians. Then with regard to language, so you need to keep one thing in mind, language is an important part or an important aspect of any civilization. Whenever you are studying about a language, it is going to tell you about the origins of the language. The similarities between that language and any other language can tell you about any common roots of two civilizations. So here, the similarities between Sanskrit and Latin were identified. It was identified by Father Hudo. Meanwhile, the British got the revenue rights in Bengal. The British officers tried to understand the history, traditions, customs, values, beliefs and laws of Indians to strengthen their trade relationships. So this is marketing management at its best where whenever you want to profit from a group of people you try to know about their beliefs so that there is a good connection some administrators were attracted towards indian literature and culture keep in mind that before the even before the europeans came into india in 16th century india was a land of rich culture and heritage so the Indian literature was booming in variety and content, which is why some administrators were attracted towards literature and culture. As a result, Manusmriti, Bhagavad Gita and other great literary works were translated into English. So translation of literary works is the first approach, is one of the first approaches we need to take to ensure that knowledge is spread out throughout the globe. Whenever there is any information source in one language, by translating it to other languages, we are ensuring that it reaches a larger group of people. So this happened to great literary works of India, including Manasprati and Bhagavad Gita. Sir William Jones contributed immensely to the study of Indology. So the study of India is called as Indology. Okay, Sir William Jones, we can see his picture here. 
he contributed immensely to the study of india he came to india as a judge of the supreme court of bengal and established the asiatic society in 1784 ce that is the 18th century at kolkata so uh, kolkata was called calcutta back then william jones he established the asiatic society in kolkata sir william jones who ha- who was a multilingual expert multilingual lingual has got to do with language okay so whenever somebody speaks more than one language you can call them as multilinguals if you speak two languages you are called as bilingual okay most of indians we are multilinguals we speak not only english we also speak our mother tongue and possibly other languages so here coming back to the lesson sir william jones was a multilingual expert and translated great works like geeta govinda manava dharma shastra and kalidasa's shakuntala from sanskrit to english so observe one thing whenever you need to uh, be a translator you need to have expertise in not just one but in two languages that is the source language and the output language okay another prominent orientalist and indologist was max muller he was a german scholar who wrote an english work sacred book of the east in 50 volumes james mill a histor so let's just highlight their names we have james mill a historian from scotland wrote history in india in 6 volumes and the other person we talked about was the orientalist and indologist that is max miller but these scholars never visited india so perhaps their sources were also literary they never actually came to india and witnessed anything happening but they just wrote the books abbe du boy a french missionary arrived and settled at ganjam near shirangapatna he lived as a sage by adopting the local culture and customs he was called doddu swami by the local people he wrote hindu manners customs and ceremonies he has presented indian customs values thoughts festivals and varnashrama system in his work Abbe Du Bois lived here for 24 years and returned to France. Apart from these, Elphinstone, Coles, Brooke, Cunningham, Elliot and Dawson have introduced the different stages of in- Indian history. So these are the last names of these historians. Usually it is fairly common to refer to people by their last names. Francis Buchanan, Colonel Wilkes, Mackenzie, B. L. Rice, Fleet, and other European scholars have successfully recorded and preserved inscriptions, manuscripts, chronicles, testimonies, and customary events for the reconstruction of Karnataka history. Thus, Europeans have been successful in introducing a novel way. of understanding and constructing history to the indians in this way they have provided indians a new process of thinking and a new perspective to construct history so let us go back and try to make notes from the top so what we learned is that indians had their own way of creating history however european way was a little more systematic and this was introduced to indians as the europeans came to india in the 17th in the 16th century so what did we learn let's go from the top the jesu priest that arrived in india what did we learn from them they undertook a systematic study to understand the lifestyle of indians 
So the Jesu priest, they did a systematic study to understand the lifestyle of Indians. Then we learnt about Hendrik Roth who settled in Agra and translated Sanskrit grammar into Latin languages. So the next point is going to, uh, going to be about Hendrik Roth who was settled in Agra and he translated Sanskrit grammar into Latin. Observe whenever you are writing a language always capitalize the first letter. Next we learnt about Father Kudo who identified that there are many similarities between Sanskrit and European languages. So make sure you get the spellings of the Europeans right. Father Kudo. Okay. So what did he do? He identified similarities between Sanskrit and European languages. Similarly, you need to make notes of all the other important points that we have highlighted throughout this section. Most of them, it's about the European Indologists and historians and their works. And finally, we need to talk about Abbe Du Bois. Okay. So I've just made this list of the important points. You can take a minute, pause the video and go on, try to make your own notes. These notes are going to help you a lot when you are studying. Okay. Now, let's continue. Here we have the new word. New words. Uh, so let's start from the top. The first word is Jesuit. The Jesuit word, let's see where it comes from. In 1534, Ignatius Loyola established the Society of Jesus in Paris. This is a male religious congregation of the Catholic Church. The members of the Society of Jesus, they are called as Jesuits. So we learnt about the Jesuit priests. So this is where the word comes from. Next is missionary. The religious preachers who are sent to a foreign country to spread Christian religion, they are called as missionaries. Next we have Indology. This is the branch of knowledge or science which studies the culture and history of India. Orientalist. The European scholars who are interested in the history, culture and spirituality of the Eastern countries. Alright. So, here are the new words. Finally, we have a note about the uh, abbreviations that are used throughout the lesson that is CE and BCE. So, CE means common era and BCE means before common era. So, these are being used in place of AD and BC. Previously in history, the words Anno Domini and before Christ were very popular to denote the timeline. But now they are being replaced by most, more religious neutral abbreviations that is the common era and before common era. These abbreviations are being used in social science textbooks. Alright, that is the end of the lesson. Now let's start with the fill in the blanks with appropriate words. The father of history is Herodotus. Next we have Sir William Jones established the Asiatic Society. Up next we have answer the following in a sentence each. So what you need to do now is go through the questions and try to find the answers in your notes. If you are missing any details or answers you can refer to the textbook and then add it to your notes and answer the question simultaneously. Take a minute and write down the answers so you can check with the answers that I am 
giving you. Pause the video, then replay it to find the answers. So here are the answers. What is history? The systematic presentation of past events is called history. Second one, who is the father of history to which country does he belong to? Herodotus is the father of history. He belongs to Greece. Why there cannot be a history without sources? So we learned that without the details about where, when and by whom, the historic event cannot be considered as authentic. Without the clarities about events, which can only be obtained from so without the clarity about the events which can only be obtained from sources history becomes a story fourth one list the historical sources historical sources can be literary or archaeological fifth one what are the archaeological sources answer the physical remains or ruins of the things used or the constructed structures in the past are called as archaeological sources. This is the definition taken verbatim from the textbook. Name the historian who studied Indology. So we learnt about two historians. One is Sir William Jones and Max Muller. They were Indologists. Okay. Let's move on. The next one is discuss in group and answer. Write a note on Abbe Dubai. So for this one, I'll just point out the important points that you need to add. So from, you need to start from here where we start learning about Abbe Dubois. So he was a French missionary and he arrived in Ganjam near Srirangapatna. He lived as a saint by adopting the local culture. You need to write that he was called as the Daswami and his work is Hindu manners, customs and ceremonies. You, you can add up until here where he returns to France. Okay, so you need to add all these to your discussion up until here. Okay, now let us move on to match the following. Match the items in the list A to those of list B. First we have Kalidasa. We know that he wrote Shakuntala. Next Max Muller. So Max Muller wrote the sacred book of the East. James Mill wrote history of India and Sir William Jones established the Asiatic Society. Up next, we have discuss. Why do we need history? Discuss. So to answer this question, we need to go back to the beginning of the lesson. You can also go to the beginning of your notes. So let's start by with the definition of history. We need to start with what is history? So history is the systematic presentation of the past events. Now to tell why it's important, we need to add these two lines. It introduces to the journey of human beings. It tells the failures and successes of humans in that journey. Okay. Next, we can also add a point about our experience. Let's Add the point about human experience from here. As human beings need memory, the society and nation also needs memory and it is inevitable. Okay, so up until here, you can add the next pointers. Then you can mention that history is like the memory to a larger collective of people. And finally, you can also add this point where history is the way to transfer the principles, values and ideologies to descendants. And you can also add the points 
about history being the mode mode to transfer or to know the valor adventures patriotism and sacrifices of our ancestors depending upon how long you want your answer to be you can paraphrase these sentences to become shorter so the sections that i have highlighted in green they are the possible pointers that you can add to your answer note that your answer can be different from what i have suggested here you can also add or remove points as you think okay students we have come to the last activity listen to the stories of your elders and write in your own sentence okay so this one you can ask the elders in your homes and your teacher for stories that they know of the past events and then you can make notes of it in your own words we have reached the end of the first lesson i will see you all in the next video